And we have President Sullivan coming in in an hour. So I do want to give him 2.30 to 3. So I'm hoping we can just get a flying start. It's cupcake time now. And, um, and if we could begin, we don't have either Senator Polino or Senator Starr. I'm trying to get him. That's all right. Um, we do have Suzanne Young for the administration. So Suzanne, would you like to start? And, and would you like to bring anybody to the table with you or just? No, I, um, I was going to turn it over to Trish Coates from, from Okay. Um, Vermont please, you, State you Colleges after I teed it up a little bit. And uh, thank you. Because I too have to, to leave for a weather call. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for the record. My name is Suzanne Young. I'm the Secretary of Administration. Uh, and I want to thank the Chair for inviting uh, me in today to talk about um, it. The proposal or in the governor's um, budget. The governor has proposed um, $200,000 of one-time money that we have from the FY19 surplus to be directed to the Vermont State Colleges. And the purpose of, of the appropriation is for the Vermont State Colleges to uh, put some energy and some uh, expertise and some people power behind uh, developing a potential associate degree program, which we found very exciting in, in concept, and so we supported the direction of the money to the Vermont State Colleges to, to work on the concept and come back and see if it would indeed be something um, that we could um, get behind and support. So to begin, um, when we look at when we were looking at budgeting and we were looking at the education space, the governor, as I'm sure you're all aware, and he's talked about it, and I think most of his speeches is really interested in, in the cradle to career education system. And for him, that means putting you know money in the front end before kindergarten, and you, um, I'm sure you'll be hearing more about his proposal to direct um, $7 million into um, early education, early care and learning. And uh, this is the other end, the, the to career end, where after uh, high school, um, we're, we're making sure that we're providing training for the young adults and the, um, training them up to the tech um, skills that we need in today's um, economy and um, making it more affordable and easier for, for those students to, to achieve an associate's degree or some other certification. And, um, at the jobs that are out there right now for the taking. So with that, uh, we also look at um, the demographics. And to me, I just brought one piece of paper for you all. And I just forwarded it to Jean, I believe, so you have it for the record. But this is um, just two pieces of data points for the committee, uh, the county labor force data and the percent change since its peak um, in each county, since we're dealing with senators, we thought you all might be interested in how your <laughs> county is doing. So what these two slides show you, I'll leave some out for the crowd here. Um, so what the first slide I would look at is the percent change in the K through 12 enrollment by county. Uh, and, and it just, just illustrates by county the decrease in the enrollment um, since 2004 in each county. And as you can see, the, the K through 12 enrollment is a pretty stark decrease in, in some counties. Uh, and it's a decrease in every county, um, with the most minimal one being um, Chittenden and Memorial. Oh, Franklin, I'm sorry, yes. Senator Parent. Um, <laughs> Franklin followed by Lamoille and Chittenden, but the most stark is the, um, you know, the 25, 41% decreases, Essex, uh, Windsor, and Addison. So this just illustrates that you know, we are, we have an ever decreasing population in the, in the K through 12, um, and the cradle to career is really to try to spread out the um, 
the resources that we're putting into decreasing population in K through 12 and, and it's spreading them out over a, a longer um, time frame for students, giving them a healthier start and helping them you know, get into the workforce at the end. So the idea presented by the Vermont State Colleges certainly was in keeping with, with that goal. And um, you know, the governor's focus has never you know, been on decreased spending, but, but realigning the resources to the demographics that you have in front of you. And our challenge with um, developing you know, workforce development and the jobs that our employers need and how we can better train them up. So we um, can I ask you a question about this? Sure. This, these are supposed to be declines in the. No, on the labor side, I'm sorry, I should have been more clear. On the labor side, these are declines. Just the okay. way the data was reported to us, one was reported as declines and the other wasn't. But All these right. are the declines in the labor force data since the peak, and what we have are peaks. Every county um, over. A, period since 2004, again, I believe, but I have it right here. So these should be negative yeah. percentages. Two, yeah. okay. So from 2000 to 2017, we have data, which we could get to, which we'll put it in context, which basically shows by county um, what, the, what the peak labor force was in each county. And in each county, that's a different year. Mm -hmm. um, so what this shows is that since Essex County hit its peak, and well, I can just tell you, in 2009, um, yeah, today it's a decrease of 19.23 percent. So yes, that is not clear. Okay. Plus, they're both negatives. Got it. Um, just presented as one. Say apples to apples. Yeah. So. Just to give you an overview of some of the items other than, than this that um, are included in the governor's FY20 budget. Um, again, I mentioned he's proposed an additional $7 million into the child care system to make it accessible and affordable for, for low income and working families. Um, always trying to help uh, people pursue education and training opportunities outside the traditional college track and, and earn credentials as well. So there's an increase in funding for BSEC's non-degree grant program by over a million dollars. Um, continued investment in the capital bill for adult CTE equipment grants and the committee wants to hear some you know, really exciting um, work that's going on. These grants have proven very successful and about 75% of last year's grants have already um, gone out the door and they're buying equipment um, that is mobile so it can be brought from you know, tech center to tech center and it's um, just been a really I, I think successful program and the Commissioner of Labor um, can talk about what's going on in that space. And so we've recommended that that program be continued with additional capital money this year of um, $800,000 over the two years of the bill. Um, we've put in $700,000 for UVM because of their declining Medicaid revenue, and so that's to bring them back um, to replace the, the Medicaid revenue that they've lost, they're going to lose this year. And then bringing us up to $3.2 million to the Vermont State Colleges. And Trish can fill you in a little more on the details on that. But $2.5 million of that is to buy down a 3% tuition increase that was um, voted by the board for this upcoming academic year. Um, some additional money to their base um, for ongoing operations. And then the, the point two is the $200,000 of the one-time money that, that would go to um, developing this associate degree program. And just for clarity, those last items you mentioned are not related to the seven million uh, direct towards the end, which would be the sales tax, online sales tax money. Yes. Okay. Yes. The the uh, yes the the revenue that if if we clarify the sales and use tax laws to extend to the modern marketplace, we we are anticipating about seven million dollars in additional revenue there which we had proposed to be um, directed into the early, early care community. Um, so again, I thank you for inviting me in to, to tee up a discussion about this program. And uh, at this point, 
Um, I'd like to turn it over to, to Trish Coates and Pat Mole. Oh, there she is, just in time. Um, who's really been doing the yeoman's work on this, uh, pulling together you know, the strings and some ideas about what, what this would look like and why they need a consultant to help them design the program. What, what excited us about it is the potential. You know, again, there's no, there's no clear program on the table yet because this is what this money is designed to do, is to help us design it. But the, the potential for this being something that a high school student could um, use in a tech center complete their senior year in high school in their tech center and uh, receive one year of uh, credit towards an associate degree and potentially spend a second year in their home tech center and, and earn a, an associate's degree without having to incur the cost of um, room, board, travel, meals. Um, that would be uh, something that we think is would be really a great opportunity for, for that student body. Now, whether we'll be able to pull that off is remains to be seen, but we thought it was well worth putting um, some of our extra surplus money into that study. So. Um, just one thing before you yeah. leave. First, thanks for coming in. Well, thank you. Second, we had a caucus today, a Democratic caucus, and I talked briefly about this, and Pro Tem had been studying up on his own, um, and his immediate comment was, um, don't necessarily feel you have to stop with a pilot. If it's possible to go bigger, and the committee feels that that, that makes sense, feel oh. free to propose something bigger. So uh, I'll just um, pass that on to, to your side, that uh, okay. you know, there's a good reception so far, okay. even to, to the extent that um, you might have a mandate to go well, thank you. Well, we really look forward to what, um, if this passes, and, and come June we have the money available. We look forward to the work that, the fine work, you know, that state colleges will do on this. So thank you very much for having me in. Thank you. And I think I'll sit and listen for a little while. But. Uh, so feel free to come in the order you prefer. I, I don't know, Trish, Pat first. Me? Would you like? Okay. The timing was good. <laughs> nice, nice to see you, Pat. I think since economic development, I don't see you. Right. Do I look any different? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for the chance to be here. So I'm ready to start when you are, Mr. Chair. And if I could just say, Senator Polino, we we already moved into the um, to the administration uh, making their uh, pitch. Do you mind waiting? Uh, just through Pat's testimony, and then we can have you say a few words. Sure. Uh, well, actually, you're here to speak about your um, free college bill. Right. OK. Um, could we ask you to come back? Because I, I think this discussion is going to take half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, could we ask you to come back after 3? To you could. OK. <laughs> could, you, could you do that? I could do my best if you could. Okay. Because we, this is a, a sort of more uh, a, a somewhat separate issue, so. Okay. All right, look, I'll sit for a couple minutes. Okay, sounds good. Please, Pat. Great. Well, good afternoon. I'm Pat Moulton, and I'm president at Vermont Technical College, and I'm uh, about two and a half years into my presidency there, and as Senator Brief noted, I come from an economic development and workforce development related background. I've, often refer to myself as a recovering bureaucrat, um, <laughs> having worked in and out of state government a variety of times. But it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about this opportunity today. And uh, we are very excited about the possibility to examine and plan for how we might do this. And we're very grateful that uh, Governor Scott has built funding into his budget. And as uh, Suzanne Young had indicated, we still have probably more answers than, or more questions than answers at this point. But Really, the idea is to offer all or a portion of a, an associate's degree at our career and tech ed centers. And the hope is that this opportunity prevents, provides better, more affordable access to higher education, to students throughout Vermont. Um, and also, the hope is that we can pick up some percentage of those students who do not pursue any education after high school by making it more accessible and more affordable. And I won't give you chapter and verse. I know you know it and in terms of the importance of some education beyond high school 
and the direct correlation between education and earning capacity, uh, and therefore um, careers and, and um, contentment in folks' one's life. So that is really the hope. And also, if we can do this well and figure out the scheduling, it's very likely we can provide this as an opportunity for working adults as well to access uh, higher education and a degree. And we're clearly hoping that this is a pathway for more students to come to Vermont Technical College and earn a, a technical degree, as that is just a screaming need <coughs> in the workforce right now. We also believe this is an opportunity to try to, I don't want to, I don't want to imply anything negative here, but kind of elevate the image of career and technical education by having college level courses available, but also that we can entice students that are high school students who may not be in CTE to consider CTE and or come in and start their degrees there, or start a degree there. There are lots and lots of questions, and I guess my one statement is if this were easy, we would have done it by now, um, which is part of why the, the funding that the governor has proposed that enables us to really examine how to do this in a way that is a win-win for everyone, win for students, win for CTE, win for Vermont Tech and higher education. And to do that, we really need to fully investigate the ins and outs. How does this impact accreditation? How would this, uh, how do we fund this model? Where are the funding risks? Um, where are the opportunities in terms of funding? But, um, and that's important because to be perfectly honest, Vermont Tech is not really in a position to absorb financial risk at this point. Um, Budgets are tight and getting tighter every day, so um, we are not able to put risk capital on the table. Um, the funding is also really critical in that we don't have a lot of capacity. I don't have somebody I can take off anything and assign to this work. So the opportunity to either, whether it can be a consultant or um, freeing up existing staff who have familiarity, that's to be determined. But we really need to, to dive into the ins and outs. and. And um, I had prepared a very, very, very rough draft that I understand you have, Mr. Chair, that really starts to outline where a lot of those questions are and where the questions exist. But I'm viewing this as we have potentially up to 16 regional labs that we can use through our career and tech ed centers. And in some cases, those labs are in better condition than we have at the college. So um, I see that as a real opportunity as well as, as decentralizing education to Vermonters. Our nursing program is right now quite decentralized. We offer nursing in 12, 12 locations around the state. Are there other programs we can bring out and do the same type of thing? And how do we do that in partnership with Career and Tech Ed so that they see the win and the opportunity as well? So I'm, I'm happy to answer whatever questions I can for you, um, but know that you'll probably give me more questions that we need to answer, but some I may have an idea of where we want to head, but we need to build the model first. So. I, I've asked Senator Parent to send to Jeannie your email okay. with the language, so we'll all have a copy in a minute. Okay. In advance of that, um, there's 200,000, which has already come forward in the governor's budget, mm -hmm. um, and I believe um, the appropriations committee uh, is fine with. So, um, what do you specifically see that going to pay for? Well, in the short term, it would be to pay for, as I say, either a consultant or um, some staff that we could bring on to really analyze the questions and determine the ins and outs. Depending on what that cost finally looks like, there may be some remaining funds that could help towards implementation. It's, it's hard to know right, sitting here right now. But the expectation is that there would be adequate funding to fund up to a couple of years of, of having somebody who is focused on answering the questions and then moving towards how we could implement. Um, and that may be different people still still trying to figure that out. Um, and I'll apologize that this, we didn't know for sure that this was going in the governor's budget until December. So yeah. um, we've been scrambling, uh, trying to put some, some, some of the skeleton together and some meat on the bones and, and have at least identified the important issues we need to address. We have reached out to four different technical centers to determine their interest, and they have indicated, <coughs> yes, they're interested in working with us. Um, we do a lot of work with CTEs now, so um, I'm sure that number will expand, but we want to walk before we run, quite mm -hmm. frankly, so that's why we're not 
top yeah. of everybody quite yet. Are those four technical centers geographically distributed? Uh, yes, Northwest, North, Northwest St. Albans, North Country, Newport, Stafford, Rutland, and Hartford in uh, White River is the four that we've talked to okay. thus far. So. <coughs> so, I mean, it would be, with the $200,000, you could probably have a full-time person for two years. Exactly. Um, yeah. Is that what you're thinking probably? That, or um, we have an individual that works for us, Lyle Jepson. He was the director at the Stafford Tech Center for a number of years, went to work for Castleton for a while. He's now working for us, running our um, certified um, technical education teacher preparedness program. We do licensing for um, tech ed. Text, career text um, teachers. We might try to backfill some of the work he's doing around administrative, et cetera, to free him up because he's he knows CTE, he knows the VSC. Alternatively, look for somebody who um, might be out there. We know of a couple people who have been in and around CTE in Vermont or in and around um, the state colleges so that we're not really having to have somebody climb a big learning curve and learn about Vermont or these systems, but that can hit the ground running. Um, and then um, to go along with what I um, said when Suzanne was testifying, um, the, my discussion with the proton was very positive and um, he was thinking about it in terms of how could we uh, go bigger um, rather than smaller. I immediately started thinking, can we have something working by September? If we don't, then we're going to have to wait um, probably another year. And myself, I would, I would rather not be talking about 2021. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's such a, uh, because we're not reinventing the wheel. We're, we're doing early college, which exists, which has very well-defined <coughs> financial pathways, as well as mm -hmm. you know, um, feeders from high schools into the early college program. So that would be my question is, is there a way to um, working quickly get the first class of this in <coughs> September uh, without making mistakes without um, you know, ultimately disadvantaging anybody by screwing up how their credits work or anything like that. But you know, if it's their final year, I'd hate, I'd hate to have to wait three classes, basically. Mm -hmm. This year's to finish, next year's to go, and then a third one. Um, so if we could go with the class of, you know, the beginning of September, that would be um, ideal, I would think. That would be ideal, uh, but I have to be honest, since coming into higher education, I have a yeah. far better appreciation for why things take so long. Mm -hmm. um, as an example, we're scheduling now next fall. So for us to try to figure out all the where's and why fours of all this, I and then market it appropriately to students so that they see the opportunity. I think it's a lot aggressive to make September happen and not make mistakes. I mean, one of the big questions is we're talking about high school seniors that still have high school requirements to finish out, and then we want to put 30 additional credits for a full year on top of that. Is that even physically possible within that high school schedule? Can it be done? Um, or how close to 30 credits can we get? And um, also planning for what, in order to maximize the potential for these students and, and uh, help assure su success, have, do we might have to go look at their junior year and just say, what kind of courses are they taking that are going to support and help them ease into this program in their senior year? So we've kind of got to reverse engineer the process a little bit uh, to get into that. And, and so and you can appreciate coming from higher education, things don't yeah. move too fast. But um, so it would be our goal, but I, I, I don't want to raise an expectation that I don't think we can deliver. If we're going to do this and do this well, we're, I mean, especially if we're looking at funding in, let's say, July, if, assuming the bill passes, the budget passes, then, I mean, that doesn't give us much time to September. And we're going to continue conversations, obviously, keep working on this. But I just, I, I, I understand your point about not wanting to miss <coughs> these classes. But yeah. keep in mind that we're already doing a lot of dual enrollment. We have VAST. We have concurrent enrollment. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities right now for students to take advantage of college credits. But to really set this up as a degree is 
more work. And, and kind of in his train of thought on feasibility, mm -hmm. um, something I think would be really powerful this program, and I just want to get your comments initially on it, um, is what if we were to turn these tech centers where like that person could do their first year, their senior year, to come back to that tech center to actually finish that right. associate's degree right. in St. Albans or in Newport or any of their tech centers so they may not have to move on to campus. They could, right. you know, how feasible do you think that is? I think it's very possible. And, and I think that for certain programs that is very doable. The question is which programs. And so <clears throat> really looking at where do the, is, do the CTEs offer good lab space? Where are the instructors of uh, have the educational background and meet our accreditation standards? I mean, accreditation alone is going to be an issue that we've got to address. But I think it's possible. <clears throat> Being candid, if we do that, it does. Uh, some of the questions I've had already is well, if we decentralize this to CTE, why do we need these programs on campus? And I think that's a good question. And, it, and yet, that's going to be disruptive of our college model. Um, being you know, very clear and transparent, I'm not certain that's a bad disruption. I mean, I think it could be the right answer, but something we've got to really examine pretty closely. I also think that there are certain programs, I know we have degrees that we can't duplicate at, uh, at CTE. There isn't any clear pathway or you know, new, built, uh, new labs, whatever the case might be. So I do think the two-year offering is, is a, has a lot of opportunity for certain programs, particularly programs where well, they're all in big demand, but looking at things like you know, um, auto tech or construction management, things of that nature, where there just is a lot of screaming need um, and, and not enough students coming in the funnel, if you will, directly. I would say that's true of any program we offer, but um, I do think there are some that lend themselves nicely to a two-year offering, uh, but we've got to look at what that long-term impact means, and, and frankly, need a little time. And so I think piloting one, two, maybe three programs makes some sense so we can collect the data. Are we, in fact, capturing students who didn't otherwise go on to college? Are, we, are they being successful? Are they meeting the needs? Are we delivering this in a way that uh, meets our accreditation and, and um, learning outcome needs? So just to clarify, it seems from this, what the thought is is to do a study Mm -hmm. um, free up the two hundred thousand dollars at the same time to, to allow the hiring to have that person be conducting the study. Correct. Um, then do a pilot program. I hear you saying the pilot program would be not starting in September, but a year from September. Very likely. Yep. And so then we would be rolling out the whole program if we expand <coughs> more like three years down. Yeah, I, I would think if we could do our first pilot fall of 20, we could potentially, I mean, maybe we could do more than one pilot fall of 20. Um, then if we see that there's, and we want at least, I think, a year of data, um, maybe a couple, but at least a year of data to know uh, how are students doing, how, how are, are we attracting more, are we attracting adults, um, then we could roll additional programs out after that as, as appropriate. So. I, you, you've used the phrase several times, screaming need. Yeah. I agree with you. And, and not even putting it in terms of need, but opportunity for kids. Right. Um, so I, I just want to say I'm on board with right. everything but the timeline. I'd like to do it somewhat faster. And maybe, maybe that, you know, maybe we go from a study to a rollout instead of a pilot. Um, and Trish, do you remember in terms of um, the development, I think it was in Act 77, of dual enrollment. What was the lead time from when we passed the Act to when we started giving out those? Well, yes, being made that it was already it was already in place, so we already had a dual enrollment program prior okay. to Act 77. But it was limited. Right. Um, right. Same with early college, we had fast. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here similarly, I'm thinking we have an early college program. We must be able to piggyback in large part on that structure now. Well, it, I think it's the it's the degree delivery yeah. at the tech center level that is going to yeah. work. Okay, um, Pat. Anything else you'd like to add? 
Um, not unless there are other questions that folks will say. So it's, it sounds like you haven't gotten this far. So I mean, a lot of my questions might be answered when you actually do your study. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, we already have a bunch of these programs that we've mentioned, the dual enrollment and early college program. We also have community or uh, CCV campuses all over the state in most of our counties, I think. Yep. So I'm wondering if I've heard, like you have said screaming me, and mm -hmm. clearly we don't have enough kids who are graduating from high school and then going on to higher education, but have you done any kind of um, enrollment or demographic analysis to see where the need is, what the need is, how many, and if we would be serving new kids that aren't already served by one of these other programs so that we're not just constantly sort of targeting the same kids. Um, right. Um, the short answer is no, not any kind of deep dive analysis, but and, and the early college programs that we have now are very effective. And, and we're seeing, I mean, vast, we, I think we're at 95, 96% of our students go on to college. We're pleased that a higher percentage are actually staying at Vermont Tech every year. I think the difference is we're not able to deliver technical education mm -hmm. in the same way. And, and this is about trying to bring a good accredited technical degree out into technical centers um, to bring and build that pathway. So I would believe that there are students out there now who, and this is all anecdotal, and, and who would love to get into, say, an auto or a diesel program or a paramedicine <clears throat> program, but between the tuition, room and board, or um, even just the usual fear of college, they're not they're not doing it. So I think the opportunity, I mean, we saw an increase in the number of nursing students when we increased, and, and, and well, I can't say decentralized, we picked up a bunch of existing nursing schools, but provided a, a um, constant, rigorous curriculum across all that met all the needs. This would be the same type of opportunity for a technical degree. So I don't think we have a, a really, I mean, we do dual enrollment of a number of our programs through our high schools. But there's a limit, obviously, on the number of credits, they, the number of vouchers they can get. Um, vast, a lot of those students are coming in knowing what their major is. A lot are undeclared. So I do feel that there is a population out there that would take advantage of this. But no, we haven't done that analysis in any depth at this point. I mean, somewhere in this study, I'd love to see us do some survey work. Um, you know, ask high school students, how likely would you be right. to take a degree? Because program. I would be concerned that it would have an effect on you. You guys are already having enrollment issues. And yep. if you have even more enrollment issues as a result of this, what's the impact on your existing programs? Mm -hmm. um, and is there, with our declining K-12 population, is there a need to continue to expand options for people? Or do we need to start thinking about maybe some of the options we currently have are no longer relevant if we move to different options. Um, so I, I, I would just think they're uh, negatively affected. If some of these kids who might take advantage of this would not actually then go to the Vermont Technical College in Randolph because they are going to be taking advantage of this. But I see them as getting a VTC degree in either case. Right. VTC is going to get paid. But then will the number of kids, number of students at, at their campus in Randolph decline, or the number of students but that does, are in there? That's a question. But it doesn't CCB. matter if they're getting paid. In, in other words, if you take Corey's idea that they get their degree, um, but they're, they're being accredited and the, the credits are being provided by VTC, the money would go to VTC or be shared, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, it seems like a positive addition. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I think it's mostly just where's the saturation point for this mm -hmm. kind of, for and all of these programs. We have mm -hmm. lots of different avenues mm -hmm. and yeah, we still have a low college mm -hmm. entrance and graduation rate in our state. So we've created a lot of these entrance pro entrance programs into higher education and they're not having the effect in what would what yeah, one other one mean? And I, I would just like to see a broader analysis, sort of writ large, of all of these to see what's being effective, what's cost effective, what 
um, what it, what is actually getting students to get into college and to graduate with a degree that they can then use um, in whatever field they're in. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and to be perfectly honest, I mean, some of the concern I've heard from folks on my campus is exactly that, is will students say, oh, great, I'll, I'll take the option to stay home. So yes, we're still getting paid. We're not getting the full tuition, as I understand early college's percentage. Second, mm -hmm. we're not getting room and board. Um, that all has financial impact. And so you know, as I've looked at it, if we've got, let's say, you know, 20 students in a program now, and we decentralize and we've got 10, and then 20 in the other, we're, we're no net better off. We haven't grabbed anybody new. We've shot ourselves right. in the foot. Just Whereas if we're, the <laughs> right. Whereas if we're 20 now and we end up with 10 and there's 30 out, then, then that's a net benefit and, mm -hmm. and more kids are taking advantage. It's better for us. Um, so I think some of that really remains, my, my gut is that if it were me and I knew I had a college program right in my backyard, that would be a no brainer. Um, but. What, would that, what, what does that look like long term for the college is, is part of it. But also really understanding, will students take advantage of it? And I think it's a, a legitimate question in terms of at what point have we provided so many options and, and they're still not coming? And, and you know, where are the real nuts and bolts problems? I mean, I deal with this every day on my campus. I'm sure everyone in higher ed does in terms of level of preparedness of students coming out of high schools. It's not, it's not what it used to be. And, it makes harder, life harder for us. So that's why the idea of you know, one of the things to really look at is can we add 30 credits to a senior year in high school? And will those students succeed doing that? And what are the student supports that we need to be able to provide that are over and above what they might be getting now in tech centers? And you know, accreditation, all locations, all modalities, all students. So we've got to make sure they're all getting the same tutoring support, the same counseling support. And, and you know, we hear a lot of anecdotes about overworked guidance counselors at high schools and so I mean all, all that's got to get sorted out. I think it's doable but we we want to walk again before we run. So. I'm, I'm wondering if it's to collapse the timeline just a little bit so that I understand rolling, rolling out the program in September would be very hard. Could you do a very small pilot starting in September that potentially yeah that you have all your you know you can see all the moving parts. You know, you've got a pilot class of 10 or something. Mm -hmm. And then you could use, of the 200,000, you could use a chunk of it to fund the, the issues surrounding that pilot and the full-time person. That way, you could take them through a whole class, uh, or that class through a whole year, and you'd have that by the following September. Um, just mm -hmm. it seems like that would be um, just, you know, maybe you learn a little bit uh, yes. as you drive those 10 people through, mm -hmm. but they'd be highly, the most highly motivated. Mm -hmm. Senator McNeil. Um, I see this as getting some students interested, because they're already at the tech centers, but to go on to college, whether it's a, you know, the tech center or another school, maybe they'll change their majors more than once before they right. actually graduate, but I'm seeing this as a, an entry level to walk in uh, if it's a senior, possibly in, uh, in a tech center. Uh, most of their credits are already, they're, I've already taken their credits for the year. I mean, some of the kids in junior year might only have one class left. Right. Those are the ones that you want to target because they're getting part-time jobs, say changing tires uh, at a car dealership where they should be learning how to you know, repair vehicles. So right. I'm thinking that, that this is a, an easy, something easy that can be done in a small size, small scale. Mm -hmm. And while Jepson has the most experience in tech, mm -hmm. uh, he was at Stafford Tech for years and went on to Castleton University, mm -hmm. but he's got the experience to pull this off. And that's, he probably has it all written out someplace. And, <laughs> and I've got lots of musings from Lyle, absolutely, he has, yes. Yeah, he's got, uh, he doesn't need to sleep like most of us right, do. Right, so, right, <laughs> yeah. But I'm sure he can pull this off. And, I th a small this. pilot is, is potentially available. I mean, okay. we, and we will absolutely look at that okay. and see what we can do. Yeah. Would you like uh, Trish to come in at the, or? I wasn't on your list today, oh. but I'm always happy to. You're always on our list. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, anything you'd like to add? 
No, uh, we're willing to keep sharing information as we get it, um, but we look forward to your support for this 200,000. Absolutely, and um, so uh, Senator Parent will be taking the lead on this mm -hmm. for us. Um, so to the extent that you have additions to language or um, if having noodled on that small mm -hmm. pilot idea, you come up with anything you can um, funnel it to him and he can look at it and then get it to us. Yep. Um, anybody else from either the administration or state colleges who wants to speak? Secretary, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate your consideration, and we look forward to working on this. Nice I do think there's a great opportunity. Good to Absolutely. see you, too. Um, Can I just add one thing? Yes. Thank you so much for thinking about students and their stress levels, mm -hmm. and whether or not they can manage in early college, early everything. Mm -hmm. Let's speed everybody toward something. I think it's really important to, to, to keep our eyes on the mental health of our kids. So. It's Im impossible to ignore, yeah. frankly, um, as more and more students come in with, with those kinds of challenges. And, and we deal with the stress level all the time. And, and you have to remember, we're talking about 17 and 18 year olds in some cases. And, and, and there are some who can ace it, and others who are going to struggle. And so um, recognizing everybody comes in at a different place, and how can we bring them all up at the same time is the key. So I realize we did have Yasmin on the uh, on the <laughs> agenda. Please, yeah, come join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you very much. Uh, is the Lock Promise program the name of this? That's what I was taking from the draft of S38. I think it, the, the language which oh, sets that that's that's the size of the genome. So we, yeah. We've shifted. Yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Right. So, so yeah, we lost it anyways. Okay. okay. Uh, so Anthony's going to come back in three. So why don't you go ahead sure. and um, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll defer his intro okay. to his bill. But Certainly. Is there another one? So, committee, just to clarify, we've got two tracks. One is that program that we'll call the, the Tech Center Early College. And then this is um, kicking off a more freewheeling discussion about um, tuition free college or tuition assisted college. Um, <coughs> Senators Ingram and Hardy have, have expressed an interest in that. Um, so my thought is we'll, we'll, over the next month, we'll take testimony on this and see where we land with it. And so uh, really this testimony is meant to be background in a way to give you a sense of the broader picture of what college affordability looks like right now for students in the state college system, how existing financial aid works, um, where some of the pressure points are. Um, and and then a little bit thinking about the, the logistics of as as S thirty eight the, the draft language is there of how that would, would play out. Um, so some of this is, is background information, um, and actually here the the third slide there's a, a reference. Um, so really I'm pulling this. You know why have other states gone forward with a college promise programs? Um, it's a very clear message around post-secondary attainment to students. Um, arguably, it's a very clear benefit, right? So how do you achieve better funding for post-secondary education? And then a third important piece is addressing um, affordability and access gaps for modest income and underrepresented populations. Um, this is, a, is kind of a summary of some other states that have had College Promise programs for a very long time. Um, and I, I won't talk too much about it, but it sort of breaks them down by different eligibility requirements. And something I'll talk about a bit <coughs> around this concept of first dollar versus last dollar um, institution types and all of the rest. Um, maybe one thing to point out here is just that um, these early programs in other states had pretty small participation rates across the total population. Um, if you go on to the next page four, um, this is data from, there's a, now a federal college scorecard that anyone can go to on the website, collegescorecard.ed.gov, 
and, um, and it gives important information for students and families. And so I've pulled out currently what is posted there, um, this concept of net cost, which is taking the total tuition and room and board expenses, right, and then subtract out all a grant aid that students get, federal grants, state grants, um, institutional grants, and scholarships. So what is left is the total cost to students, whether they're then using additional financial aid in the form of loans or um, other means, work study, to, to cover that cost. But these are the net costs just for a range of institutions in Vermont. On average. On average, right. And this is for students in the bottom uh, quintile of family income, so up to $30,000. So you can see what those costs are. Uh, and this is yeah. for how many years? This is just for one, for one, one year. One year. One year of cost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you want to go to the next uh, page, um, this is data actually from VSAC. Um, they have been following the class of 2012 looking at where those students go to post-secondary, what their profile is, and what their outcomes of success are. And I think with, if you're contemplating a design of any kind of college promise program, um, that's an important consideration to think about the uh, equity considerations for students. Um, one thing I'll highlight right now um, is full-time enrollment, which is a, a condition in the draft legislation. Um, and obviously, the Vermont State Colleges in particular is an access point for Vermonters. We serve a wide range of students, and that includes a lot of part-time students, particularly at the Community College of Vermont. Um, so it's something to think about. Certainly, it's a challenge for students to go through and complete when they're going part-time. Um, and incentivizing them to go full-time is a good thing, but the reality is, um, particularly <coughs> for parents, that that's, that's really not doable. Uh, hey, if you want to, I'll pause there for a second. I know there's a lot of detail there, yeah. but really it's just background for you and some websites to go to if, if you're looking for more information. What is C? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry? Um, equity considerations, C. Oh, CU, I apologize, shorthand. That's Castleton University. Oh, okay. So I was just giving you some, some contrast to running to your <laughs> What one is that? Sure, sure, yeah. Um, okay. So then, now let's let's step back, take a deep breath, and and do a quick review on, on how financial aid works these days and how college costs are being covered. And I've just pulled, picked out Northern Vermont University as a as an example here. Um, so the total total college cost right now this fall at Northern Vermont is twenty three thousand eight hundred. And you can see the breakdown there of tuition and fees and room and board and then an expense estimate for books, et cetera. Um, so if you start with that as your total cost, and then you subtract out for a student at the lowest, at the bottom uh, quintile of family income, if you, if you assume they're getting the ex absolute maximum aid dollars in Pell, um, other supplemental federal, and the VSAC amount, um, that's about $8,000. So the net cost to the students is fifteen thousand seven hundred. Um, so that's that net cost calculation. The federal student loan maximums for first year students right now are five thousand five hundred dollars. That's subsidized and unsubsidized federal student loans. Um, so if a student takes out the maximum loan, they and their families are still faced with a cost of over ten thousand dollars. Again, this, this, is, this is a student who would be on free reduced lunch, right? This is our bottom in the class. Well, the, the cost is still 15,005. Yes, plus right, it. right. I mean, literally out of, out of people's bank accounts and, and you know, work study. Yeah, accounts. right, right. How are they, you know, they're using payment <laughs> plans, yeah. they're doing private loans our students are taking on. So that's the, that's the current reality. Um, it actually gets a little bit more challenging when you think about that next income bracket up, which is $30,000 to $48,000, because that's when the Pell Grant starts to scale down to zero. Um, so you're going from a maximum 6000 ish Pell Grant down to, down to zero. So that, that creates an even um, more challenging burden. 
So any, before I move on there, any, does that generally, um, any questions about that? So then I want to give you two s scenarios, roughly speaking, when people are designing and talking about College Promise programs nationally, there's this concept of first dollar versus last dollar. So I want to walk you through how that, what that concept is and how, what the implications are for the student. Um, so let's start with what's called a first dollar program. And the basic concept is the, the Promise Scholarship pays first, and then whatever um, remaining costs exist, students can use whatever other um, components might be at their disposal, whether that's a state grant, whether that's a Pell Grant, um, scholarships, whatever else. So in a first dollar program, again, we take the tuition amount, we take room, board, and fees, right? That gets us our 23000 And then um, the state, well, actually, you should think about the state promise scholarship being first would, would cover that tuition, so that 10944 And the student would then also have those maximum grants if they're in the bottom quintile. Um, so that net cost in a first dollar program to the student is 4700 so that net, that's a net cost in the first dollar program. A student can cover that within the federal grant maximum. Um, it, when you contrast that with the last dollar scholarship, right, essentially what that means is this, the state promise scholarship would, would only be added on after you, or would only cover the difference between the federal and VSAC grant and tuition. So the state promise, component of that would be that 2784 right. So that produces a much higher net cost for the student, um, again, at the bottom family quintile. Um, and they've got some remaining costs there. Um, now, obviously, those, those numbers in a last dollar scenario right, start shifting between the federal grant and the state grant, um, whereas in the first dollar, you would always be doing the state promise scholarship at the set amount. I hate to sound like a broken record. I I think I would redo these slides because <laughs> it makes it seem as though they're not going to have to pay the loans when in fact they're going to have to pay the loan plus interest. So it's really misrepresenting Re representing that. What's fair, fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, am I right that New York's program is last dollar? It is last dollar. Most yeah. of the new programs now are last dollar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. For obvious reasons. Right. Right. Um, any other any other questions on the two scenarios? Um, then um, now this does this is the one slide that does attempt to um, put some numbers down um, relative to the draft uh, legislative S S thirty eight. Um, so what this gives you on page eight is our total um, full time Vermont students enrolled at, at certificate associate or bachelor's degree levels. Um, so roughly across the system, we're talking about 4,000 individuals who would potentially be eligible under, under the draft legislation. So those 4,000 individuals, um, then what you have here below that is an attempt to look at, well, where, where do they fall right now on the income spectrum? So you can think about that a little bit. So this is pulled. Um, the data is a little bit older because it um, is sort of the most recent set that we have broken down through evidence this way. Um, but this gives you just the incoming first-time students um, and their experience in receiving aid and what those aid dollars on average look like. Um, so, you know, most of our students are receiving federal aid um, and you can see sort of approximately on average what they're, what they're getting. Can, can I ask, um, the numbers you have at the top, mm -hmm. the 4,000, mm -hmm. is that in the bottom quintile? No, this is everybody. everybody. This is everybody. So it's, you know, you could, as a rough approximation, take those percentages by family income and, and apply it to that top line number. Um, however, the percentages down below are of students receiving aid, so it's not 
service and everybody who's receiving it. Um, so does this translate in this proposal into a price tag? If, if you wanted to vary back of the envelope, yeah. I would take the 4,000 students yeah. and I would do this looking at that average total federal aid and say about $3,000 on average a student has of that federal and VSAC aid. So that leaves you at a tuition price of 11000 with about 8000 per student that the state promise program would need to cover. 8000 times 4000 about $32 million. Now that's 100% students. Not everybody would be eligible. You have other criteria in, in S38 right now. And if you, that was why I asked about the lowest quintile, mm -hmm. because um, if you means tested it, right. you, you have substantially lower costs. But, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's and exactly. So this is just meant to give you some information for your yep. deliberations. And then you have one more slide? Uh, yes. Yes, so just a, um, a few comments then to think about um, in crafting policy. Right now in the, in the draft, um, there's the expectation that the, the scholarship would convert to loan if a student doesn't complete. Um, you know, students who don't complete college <coughs> now and have incurred debt, that is a really challenging situation for students to be in, right? Um, and so this would compound that, potentially. Um, particularly when you start thinking about, well, will students still have some un unmet costs that they're going to have to cover some in some way? So are they going to already be taking out many other kinds of loans? So that's one consideration. Another consideration is the, the part-time student and, uh, at, well, working adult students, really. And you know there are credit enrollment strategies. CCB has been doing quite a bit of piloting of um, more intensive courses and trying to figure out how to up the intensity for a working adult so they do complete faster um, without overwhelming them. So nine credits, fall, spring, and summer gets you very close to a 30-year full year of, of college instead of a 12 credit, 12 credit model, for example. So um, that would be something to think about. And then finally, I think to a you know, point of discussion in some programs that Tennessee has, has done this, you know, do you build in some other component that really is a, a synergistic way to increase the success of student participants? So Tennessee has a required um, mentoring and some service components. Um, you know, we see dual enrollment, participation in dual enrollment as an important precursor to Success in early college, for example, would that be an important consideration for, for this program? Am I remembering right that Tennessee's began with a chunk of money from the lottery? Or yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, and that is a I think it's a particular challenge for Vermont. Um, many other states start with a much higher level of state support for post-secondary education, which means tuition is lower, so the amount that a state scholarship program has to cover is relatively less. We have a much bigger lift here. Yeah, but they did also start with low funds. Um, and so, yeah, and so I've given you, in fact, on that final slide, um, just a few details from Tennessee started with a promise program for new high school graduates and then uh, moved on to roll out just this past spring a program that they call Tennessee Reconnect. That replaced it or is it an addition? No, it's an addition. So the Tennessee Reconnect is for adults. Um, the promise program is for recent grads. Average age, 34. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, thank you so much. You're very uh, and you're right on time. Good. Good. I aim to So one, one question yeah. in the remaining minute. So um, what do you think would happen if we took thirty two million dollars and divided it by every college and gave, gave them each <laughs> whatever that portion yeah. was yeah. instead? Would that yeah. <laughs> yeah. how would that compare to, uh, to this program? Right. <laughs> Oh, simply gave it to yeah. them as opposed to saying we have a Vermont College Promise program. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's that. You know, I think there is a real value to the message to students. So, 
I, you know, when, so I, the, the things I think about are, are you going to increase the college going rate? Are you going to increase the success rate? I think to your question specifically, absolutely we would see retention go up. We see students leave every year, but for a unpaid bill of $500, $2,000. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that would, that would go along with us. Well, thank you, um, and I might have said this before, but Senators Ingram and Hardy are going to be the point people on this. Mm -hmm. So um, as, as we kick it around, Corey was just working out some numbers of the, the bottom quintile, mm -hmm. and that's about seven and a half million. Yeah, if you just take your 17% CU times your 1100 yeah. times the eight grand, mm -hmm. and across each one, yeah, it's about just under 7.5 million. Mm -hmm. So that starts to seem much more doable um, now we, just before you were in, we were talking about another program that's going to cost money. So it's all, uh, you know, it's all part of the same pie. Do, I, I had asked this before, and I'm not sure who can get this data, but sort of demographic data <coughs> on all of these kinds of programs together so we could see this is the yeah. demographics of dual enrollment, early college, the proposed demographics of this new and then this, so we can sort of. Do you mean by demographics? Do you mean who's in the program? Yeah, by income, by gender, because yeah, yeah. I know you're concerned about the dual enrollment being more focused on girls and yeah. and just sort of seeing, you know, uh, geography, where yeah. they're coming from, you know, how many are each county or each whatever. Just it would be really nice to have a big chart. Do you have that? I see. I know. Well, the Agency of Education issues a dual enrollment report with all of that information. And I'm pretty sure that's coming out very soon. And does it include the early college? We or no, but we have an early college report that we submitted two weeks ago that has that information. Okay. So both of those things I think are coming your way. Okay. Good. It would be nice to just. Put it all in front of us. Yep. And look and see how I'll make who, sure who people this. are who what, who is being served by all these programs. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, you're very welcome. Very helpful. Mm -hmm. So we're we're on a uh, okay. super efficient <laughs> schedule today. So Thanks. President Sullivan is here from UAM. Okay. Wow. And welcome, President Sullivan. Thank you very much. We uh we have a half an hour before I have to leave. Um, that doesn't mean. No, we have a half an hour. Okay. <laughs> well, at 3 o'clock, the university is hosting our annual uh, ag reception with oh. warm oh. apple pie and ice cream. So everyone is invited. Oh. Huh? <laughs> Always <Good>. fun. <laughs> Chair Bruce, I'm Tom Sullivan, President of the University of Vermont. I'm delighted to be here with this opportunity to present the university and, uh, and our request for appropriation this year. Many of you may also know that I'll be stepping out of the presidency this uh, summer, and so I want to particularly thank this committee uh, and your colleagues uh, in the legislature for the warm hospitality and generosity that you've shown me personally as well as the university. So. Thank you for this Will you opportunity. Be staying at UVM, and, and I'm going to be joining the faculty full time to teach and write. Great. So very happy about that new phase in life. Uh, uh, my presentation today is going to be rather brief. We have tried to be responsive to the instructions and the questions earlier, uh, and so we have a one-page handout, and I'll go through that rather quickly so that you can all get to your questions as you wish. Um, I wanted to remind ourselves, refresh, refresh our memory, that in 2015, there was, a, by instructive the legislature, a summer study committee to look at higher education in general. And we came back with a recommendation to the legislature, which I believe was adopted, and that was, when you come in higher education to the legislature, we really want you to focus on what the appropriation was, how you spent it, how successful you were, and how do we measure or know that. Uh, largely kind of a, a focus on the return on investment from the appropriation itself and an emphasis on performance measures, output performance measures, not just input measures. And so my presentation today is attempting to follow that uh, request um, and hence the one page which I think really illuminate uh, 
of the most important performance output measures uh, that we have. Uh, finally, in my introduction, I would just come back to what my conclusion will be so you'll see a context for my remarks. We would ask for uh, our general appropriation, that's roughly $42 million um, going forth for the next uh, year. Um, as you know, that $42 million, uh, both pre-1955, when we were a private institution, and post-1955, when we were a state-affiliated institution, um, that, although the dollars have changed, of course, over the years, the categories have not. Approximately half, in this case, 52 percent of that appropriation, we, through our discretion, set aside for Vermont student scholarships and financial aid. The other half, about $10 million, goes to medical school education. We have, of course, the only medical school in the state. And the other quarter, about $10 million, goes to support the College of Agriculture and Extension. So broken down into half student scholarships, ag, and, and medicine and extension. Um, so we would ask for the, the same general fund appropriation. In addition, I would ask for your consideration for two other items. One, and this is my fifth year asking this, we were successful last year, uh, but, but not previous years. If there's an extra surplus, we at the university very much would like to urge you to consider additional money for Vermont scholarships and financial aid for low income and lower middle income Vermonters. Affordability and financial access to higher education is absolutely critical today. And we want to put more focus and more attention, more priority on Vermont students, particularly those coming from uh, less advantaged uh, families. Um, and third and last, uh, we have uh, in the last several years really tried to focus on getting all of our students in internships. The national data report that 80% of employers when hiring first time hire right out of internships. So it's critical that students actually have an opportunity for a co-op or an internship or similar kind of practical experience while they're in college. Uh, we, in our last survey, 67% uh, of our graduating students have said that they've had an internship. And importantly, 81% of those students said it helped shape courses that they took in the future and also their career path. Trying to match that interest and passion in an academic field with a career choice. Um, so we would ask uh, for an appropriation of $200,000 to really help us support those internships in those internships which don't pay salary or pay very little. Many of the internships across the country, as you may know, actually are without any pay. Well, there are many students who can't afford that. They need the summer experience to be able to, you know, to pay the rent in the apartment or, or their um, board and room. And so we are right now at the university supplementing by $300,000 internships for students who otherwise don't have the ability because they're not being paid enough. We, we have projected that if we had a pool of 500,000, an additional two, that's the request, we could satisfy so many more needs and demands of those students, particularly in the lower economic areas. So um, general fund <coughs> continuation, extra scholarship financial aid for Vermont, lower and lower middle students, and the internship supplement if, if we could. Uh, so let me turn to the one page um, handout and move to your request and instructions and earlier conversations about uh, UVM and output performance measures. Um, if you look at the top page, you'll see that at any given time, on average, we have over 4,000 Vermonters enrolled at the university. And at any given graduation period, we have over 1,000 Vermonters receiving degrees. Now, these are bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degrees. We are not counting because we don't give associate degrees and we're not counting as certificates here. These are four-year or graduate degrees in those numbers. Um, if, if you um, go to the next slide on the right uh, in the front, you'll see that UVM today is very different than, and uh, our chair knows that because he's one of our distinguished faculty members. Our UVM as you walk across the campus is very different today, Phil, yes. as you know. 
29% of our Vermont students are first generation. Mom and dad didn't have the chance to go. 31% of our students are Pell eligible or by federal standards come from family incomes of $40,000 to $50,000. Uh, that's a very different UVM than from an earlier time. Um, and you can see coming straight down on, on our one page, 44, and sometimes this will be 45% of vacillates back, 44, 45% of our Vermont students go to the university tuition free. How is that possible? Because we take 52% of your appropriation, about 22, 23 uh, million dollars, and we set it aside directly for Vermont students, scholarships, and financial aid. And we supplement that with private uh, alumni and friends donations to make sure that we have the scholarships and the financial aid necessary for the students' access and success to UVM. 84% um, of our, uh, of our uh, students receive scholarships and financial aid, 84%. We have about $125 million in our budget set aside, again, half of your appropriation and the balance through private scholarship funds. Um, to make sure that those students um, have the financial ability to go to university. And that's need-based uh, need then? It's, it's, it's actually a blend generally between need, leading, and then of course merit. There's a certain um, expectation of success that goes with it, but almost all of that is a blend. Our Vermont students do very well at UVM. First of all, we have a preference for Vermont students in the admissions process, a preference in financial aid and scholarship process, and you can see that 92% of our Vermont students retain, or sometimes called persist. What that means is <coughs> after the first year, they come back and they go to the second and third years. Why, why is that percentage so critical? It's the number one factor that tells us whether they're going to graduate in four years. And graduating in four years is very important from a learning standpoint and a retention standpoint, as well as uh, holding the cost of higher education down. For every year you remain after four years, it gets more expensive. And of course, the opportunity costs of not being in the market with a job. And so our students, Vermont students, do very well. And you'll see that 64% of our Vermont students uh, graduate within four years, the point I was making a moment ago uh, with regard to the private and public good associated with that. And, and if you compare it to the public institutions on a national basis, that is only 35%. So we're doing very well relative to that. Finally, um, you can see the uh, uh, economic development data there. I won't cover that. Finally, if you turn to the right of the bottom page of the handout, a point I want to make is, is the cost factor. Um, what is the cost to go to the UVM? What is the um, uh, relationship, of any, to carrying loans and debt coming out? So for, a UV, for an in-state uh, student at UVM, the real question here is, from a parent or a grandparent standpoint or a student, what is the net cost of attendance? It's not the sticker price, the tuition figure. It's the net cost of attendance, which is the gross cost of room, board, tuition, fees, books, and stipend money. That's the gross cost, minus the scholarship or the financial aid package that you're getting. We sometimes call that the discount factor. And then the net is the actual cost that you would pay. So for a Vermont student, the net is $17,000, roughly $500, and the discount is about $12,000 on average that we discount the, the, the figures, and that's about a 41% discount uh, for Vermont students. Uh, now, finally, I want to mention a current topic that's an important one, and that is this debt or loan issue. Um, what the data here show is that if you look at, you can ask this question two ways. Look at a graduating class and ask yourself, what's the average amount of loan or debt coming out of that class? This data point shows that the average debt for that class, on average, is $18,000 roughly. If you ask the second question, what is the average amount of debt or loans that, that those who have loans have in that graduating class? You'll see that that's about $27,000. 
and we are substantially better off than the national figure in, from public institutions. That's a very important part. And I think the reason for that is because of the substantial amount of scholarships and financial aid, half of your appropriation, and a substantial amount of private scholarships uh, helping those students along. Um, um, and finally, uh, then I would, I would say that when you look at coming into the university as a student, the value proposition, the quality of the experience and the cost associated with it, I think UVM has a very high value proposition. And I think these output measures show, show that. The number of degrees coming out, the timing of those degrees, the cost associated, the modest debt or loans coming out. And finally, I would just mention when we think about loans and debt, the general rule is, and if you're a parent or a grandparent or helping somebody through college, the rule is if your first year salary is greater than your loan amount, it's a great return on investment. Take that loan out. If the first year salary is under your loan amount, something went wrong. That's why I hope these data points will be helpful. Happy to take any questions, Phil, uh, if I can. Uh, you know, just, I have a, a couple, then I'll go to Senator Perrin. So um, first of all, thanks very much. Uh, your tenure has seen a decline in the amount of debt for in-state students. And, uh, and I, when you first came in, you, you put that out as a goal, and I believe you hit that. Um, so the 40% rule is my first question. Yes. So just wondering, are we still, um, for, the, for the committee, there used to be a, a piece of law that said in-state tuition couldn't be more than 40% of out-of-state tuition. Um, and the university asked to have that lifted because for complicated reasons in the marketplace, it made them uncompetitive online and also for graduate courses. So. What my question would be, are we still, is that 40% still maintained, or have we eaten into that? The, the goal was, as, as uh, Phil said, the very uh, accurately and fairly, our out-of-state price point was getting too high. And to be competitive, which is about 75% of our student body because of the New England and Vermont demographics of fewer Vermont students, we wanted to have greater flexibility, and the constraint was that 40% percentage that you mentioned. So we came to the legislature, uh, they voted to, to eliminate that. And my commitment then was that this is not an opportunity or an excuse to raise Vermont student tuition substantially higher than the normal 2%. This is our ability to try to moderate the out-of-state tuition so that we get a balance that we need, but at the same time watch the price points and try to moderate it. We have done, and we're now uh, just third year going into this in terms of setting tuition. Uh, every year we have been, in fact, all seven of my years, we have been 3% or under. We will be under again, 3% for both un uh, Vermont and out of state. We've seen the positiveness in the, in the uh, admissions uh, process. And I'm happy to say in my seven years of setting uh, tuition, and budgets that we have had the 40 years of the lowest tuition increases in Vermont. This could be me. Perfect. Um, next question has to do with um, arts and sciences. Yes. And, and if you've been watching, there's a, uh, there's a <coughs> tumult on campus over cuts to arts and sciences. The administration's um, rationale is that there's been a, a rapid decline in uh, enrollment in arts and sciences, and so how do you deal with that? Um, you're outgoing, of course, but what is your sense about what the outlook is for arts and sciences? Is there a commitment to maintain that? Or, uh, and this will wrap into my last question, which concerns the presidential <coughs> search. Mm -hmm. um, but, but if you could just take the arts and sciences um, and that issue of Yes. So um, since 2008, September 2008, when the recession began, uh, there was a clear refrain national discussion uh, among parents largely. Uh, 
and, and um, the fear of the <coughs> loss of wages and jobs and so forth. And it was that if my child is going to college, I want to make sure that he or she's majoring in something where there'll be a job when they get out. It persisted and it still persists today. I think that was a very bad vocal movement. And so what we saw then is a major shift out of some of the more traditional arts and humanities and liberal arts based courses into those that have been perceived as having great ready jobs with good salaries, engineering, technology, um, science, uh, for example. Uh, across the country, over 40% of the humanities lost enrollments, largely because of that family-parent uh, discourse. We at the UVM uh, are, are only down about 16% uh, in, the, uh, in, in the liberal arts, and, and particularly here, I think, Phil, your question really goes to the humanities, mostly in the arts. Uh, the rest is, is, is doing quite well. So the problem we have seen since 08, although it's, it's stabilizing a bit, it's not continuing to go down in enrollments, is, is that the spending and the cost of maintaining is outpacing the revenue sources to support. So the focal point here is on students enrolling in certain majors, um, graduating in those majors, uh, that we call it student credit hours, um, because the student credit hours dictate the kind of tuition and the actual revenue that goes to support the college or the department. At the university, we have a very decentralized budget. All the money comes in, stays in the colleges and in the departments. That would be whether it's tuition or grant money or services or private donations. Uh, with, uh, of course, paying one's bills uh, over and above that. So it's a decentralized process and decision made, budget decisions and personnel decisions are all made in the departments and in the colleges, it's not made at Central. So you see when you have a decline in student enrollment and student majors and student credit hours, where the actual tuition revenue is not keeping up with the fixed cost, there's a serious problem and, and, and that's, that's uh, where we are now. So uh, the dean has a five-year plan to try to rebalance and correct this. Um, he's working very hard and diligently. I'm actually optimistic that we can work through this. It's some tough times <coughs> right now everywhere, particularly with the humanities and the arts and sciences, until we can get the value proposition turned around. We have to renew again to America um, that the liberal arts are the foundation for lifelong learning and understanding. As I frequently said and written since I've been here, they really are about us understanding the meaning and the nature and the purpose of life. And that the liberal arts are inexorably linked to the sciences and the technologies and the engineering and the AI, the artificial intelligence world that we apparently now live in. But you cannot understand or help direct where all the technology is taking us in the world unless you have well-grounded, well-understood, uh, well-respected liberal arts foundation. So I think Bill, the, Bill Falls, the dean, fully understands that. And uh, we're trying to work with him. But the problem is the student enrollment and student credit hours have fallen off while we have otherwise fixed costs of faculty and staff. And um, so he has been making some adjustments, particularly with enrollments where you have very few students in the class. Uh, and we have uh, adjunct or part-time faculty or faculty who are on contracts as opposed to tenure, tenure track, the more permanent faculty. Uh, those have not been touched in the sense of any cuts. Um, and he's trying to make those adjustments in an incremental way until we can get everything back through Bill's uh, five-year plan. So I see we have only about five minutes left. I want to give the others a chance. So, so uh, I guess I want to just follow up um, on the 40% <laughs> rule. You said your increases were, but I didn't hear the answer, and I might have just missed it. Are Vermonters paying more than 40% of oh. out-of-state tuition? No, this point? The, the tuition increase last year, and I'm going to propose for this year, and they were consistent with the previous two when we were dealing with, is a 2.7% increase. 
is a 2.8 percent increase, excuse me, for Vermont students. Okay, but well, it keeps it under 40 percent of the out-of-state. We, we, so we're not constrained now by the 40 percent rule. So we right. don't watch that you don't relationship, but we've been able to hold both of them down. Um, and 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 here's a, here's a very important point. One of our goals has to be to moderate or hold down the cost of higher education for students. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to do with this. On the other hand, and 74% and of all of our revenue comes from tuition, okay? On the other hand, 76% of our costs are salaries and benefits for faculty and staff. So you have a constraint on your revenue side, and now the, the value proposition problem, and at the same time, fixed costs of faculty and salaries and benefits. And how you balance that is a very acute, sharp, close call. And every year it changes. It will fluctuate on the number of students coming in, the mix between in-state and out-of-state because of tuition differentials. And just to, to speak to Cora's question, the way I've been looking at it is the concern was obviously if that governor was taken off then you might <laughs> lower out-of-state tuition but raise in-state tuition. I that was my concern. When I was in the House when it happened. I yeah. voted against it. Yeah, and I haven't seen that happen. So it doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, that's yeah. why every year we're checking uh, Senator Ingram. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about the unfortunate uh, death of uh, Connor Gage and yes. um, the um, uh, implications of actual, uh, school policy. Uh, now he was underage and uh, uh, severely intoxicated. Um, I, I understand from reading the papers that um, the university has asked fraternities to cease activities at the at the moment. What when will what, what is the university thinking um, uh, to? kind of agreement to work out with the fraternities or other social groups what you know what what what's your goal and well I, I will share with you what's been reported in the news uh, um, federal law prevent, prevents me from discussing a great detail privacy matters so uh, but I will report to you what's been reported and I believe it's in this case accurate <laughs> what's been reported in the news um, uh, this is a person um, first-year student who was found dead 2.30 um, or so on a Sunday morning uh, after Saturday afternoon. The re news has reported that he was um, heavily intoxicated. He was without warm clothes, and it was about four below two. The report uh, in the news is that the, the police uh, believe that he attended one or more fraternity parties that night. Upon receiving that information from the police, and the investigation continues, so quite frankly, there's not a lot that I know in addition to that. But immediately upon hearing that news, we suspended all social activities and all of the fraternities on campus, pending the investigation to learn more. And once that investigation is complete, we intend to take some very specific action depending upon the facts. Mm -hmm. But right now, all fraternity social activities are suspended on the campus. Mm -hmm. And has this been, would you say there's been a, a history of, of these kinds of problems? I, I, I have friends who work for other <laughs> universities and underage drinking seems to be a, kind of a chronic problem across the, the country and I just wonder how, how you feel the university's been handling this during your tenure? And we, uh, we have been very vigilant. I'm, uh, obviously, this is a very sad case. Mm -hmm. uh, almost four years ago, I set up a president's commission on alcohol and drug use on campus. And this was made up of faculty, staff, students, parents, parents, importantly, and alumni, a group of about 40 to 50 people. And in that 40-year period of time, we have seen the use of uh, of alcohol, and again, most of our student population would be underage, drop more than 30 percent. Um, we have seen um, some increases in marijuana use on campus. And the legislation that passed last year is a challenge for us because we, like every other university in every state that's passed marijuana, do not permit 
marijuana use on the campus because of federal law that makes it uh, prohibitive. So we all follow the federal law. But the fact that Vermont has legalized it, there's a certain normalization, if you will. And we're, we are seeing the use increase. And it's, it's a real challenge for us. So on the one hand, substantial decrease in alcohol use. On the other hand, cannabis use. Tom, do you want to comment anything about WE program? And its oh, sure. We, we have a, now in its third year, something called the Wellness Environment, WE, W -E. Uh, we now have between 1,200 and 1,400 students come in. They have their own residence halls. We have a, one new large residence hall devoted to WE students and two or three smaller, 25, 35 kind of students in those. These are students commit to no, no alcohol, no substance abuse usage in the residence hall whatsoever. They're engaged in nutrition classes and me, uh, mind and body health development um, uh, taught by a neuroscientist at the university. And I, we, we believe that that program and the sheer number of students, 1,400 undergraduates, typically now first year and second year because it's a relatively new program, is having substantial benefits. Um, and it still has room to grow in its own maturity and understanding and development. And the students in that class take a neuroscience class and really understand the mind-body development. Uh, let me just share one statistic which may alarm you and really is contextual in the sense of the challenges we face. And that is that neuroscience now tells us that the male brain does not fully develop until age 29 or 30. Now, um, we all knew this. Still. <laughs> I'm still working on it. <laughs> Particularly a certain <laughs> a gender knows this very well. The woman, the young woman's brain, about 25. So if you think about that neuroscience evidence, we take students in at 17, 18, 19 years old. Typically, they'll graduate 23, 24. Right in that spectrum where the brain is still developing, not and and this I'm talking about executive function and judgment and cognition. And so, if you introduce outside <coughs> substance like alcohol or any kind of drugs, including marijuana, there is an effect on that development. We know that, and that's our student population here and everywhere else. Your point. So there are really big challenges. The WE program, I think, is a really wonderful counterbalance to that. It's growing. It's growing in its own maturity and development and sophistication that inures to the benefit back to the students. And, uh, and a lot of publicity on campus about awareness <coughs> and health, quite frankly. But unfortunately, we don't reach everybody in time. Thank you. Thank you, well, thank you very much, President Sullivan. Uh, so, committee, uh, Senator Polina and Senator Starr have yet to, uh, to speak, and I, as I told you, I need to leave. They're coming at 3.15, so... Um, the Senator Starr is not here today. Oh, he's not here. Yeah. Why don't we, Jeannie, can you ask uh, Senator Polina if he and Senator Starr can come tomorrow? And that way you can adjourn... Well, we can just adjourn now. Now, yeah. Right. Thank you very much.